Hello, my name is Brad Nelson. I'm a professor at the Conestoga College School of Workforce Development. Today I have a short tutorial on a program called JamSim. JamSim is a type of discrete event simulation software, or just simply a process simulation software, that lets you uh, simulate all kinds of different processes, real-world processes. Simply uh, or simple um, sequential flow from one process to, to another to very, very complex processes with operator involvement, customers coming and in, leaving into the system. I've seen programs like JamSim used to simulate um, simple value stream maps, which I'd like to demonstrate, all the way through to very, very complex models like airports, restaurants, hospitals, um, and the like. There are three reasons that I've selected JamSim to show you. It's open source and um, very well supported. It's fairly easy to learn and the way that you interact and the terminology that you use in working with JamSim is very similar to other uh, more complex commercial packages. Also, I like the fact that it's just a standalone executable file, like literally one single file that you download off of a website and it comes in different configurations or different options to be able to run on Windows or OS, OS or Linux. Um, so it's very like, likely there's a model that you can use on whatever computer you have. And because it's just a single executable file that doesn't actually have to be installed, you don't need administrator rights. So it can be installed on college computers, public machines, and even run from just a USB stick. All right, in this tutorial, I'd like to show how to download JamSim, very simple, using the JamSim interface, building a basic model and adding processing and delivery times, adding simple KPI or key performance indicators, and then making your model a little more realistic by changing the default graphics. I'd also like to show a couple of complications. One is uh, an assembly operation, and the other is flow controls, something that you would have, for example, in a Kanban system to control inventory. All right, so I'm going to move on to uh, Chrome browser downloading and running JamSim. You'll find the program at jamsim.com, spelled with two A's. Uh, and then there's a simple download button and different options for different operating systems. For me, I found when I download the 64-bit uh, version, it doesn't actually run on my computer. It complains about my Java. I've tried to do some troubleshooting, and for whatever reason, I can't get that one to work. But the 32-bit works just fine for me. If you have OS or Windows, uh, Linux, then you'd use the universal download. So I'm going to just do a quick download the 32-bit. And you can see it's uh, only short of 9 megabytes. Very quick download and run it. This is what the JamSim interface looks like. It's a set of different kind of windows or panels. These different views can be moved around. Uh, you can see my desktop is in the background here. Um, so you can you can shift things around to suit your, your liking. Um, this main window in the middle is your modeling space. You can see the default is a three-dimensional space with a grid floor. There's an axis showing your, your x, y, and z axes. So as I say, this program can be used for some very complex, um, very realistic models in three dimensions. For the purpose of this tutorial, I suggest just starting out in two dimensions. It really does make things easier. So. I'm going to start with the controls that are up here in the upper left, or in the in the um, sort of menu bar at the top here. If I click 2D, it changes my view from three to two dimensions. I can get rid of the axis. I don't really, um, in two-dimensional space, I don't need to worry about the third axis. Um, 
And for my purposes, I like so I like a nice thing. For my purposes, I also like just a nice clean blank interface rather than having these grid lines. So click the grid lines off. Okay, so there's our model space. You've got a model title as a default. Um, if I double click on it, I can say that this is uh, Professor Nelson's Jam Sim. Oh, let's call it Jam Sim Tutorial. In the window here called Model Builder is a set of objects that you can click and drag and drop into your model. Different graphic objects, which we'll get to um, a bit later here. But I'm going to start with process flow. For me, and what I want to demonstrate is modeling a process. They're basic elements that every process has. First is an entity generator. That is something that sends some, they call it an entity, so a thing, a product, an order, into the system. There are queues, which are like inventory points, that these entities then, these things, products, raw material, whatever, um, go into the queue and accumulate. Then there are servers, and a server acts on the entity. In a typical process, that could be it cooks the hamburger, it assembles the part, it uh, does a weld, it does a, it checks the patient's temperature. All of these actions are done by servers. You don't need to add conveyors, but I like to add these. It just for me. Um, allows me to represent transportation time or transport time from a server to the next server. Typically a model will include uh, multiple sets of queues and servers. Again, I like to have them connected by conveyor. To move things around, when you click on an object, it typically has these little handles. And if you want to move them, you need to hit the control button and then the left mouse, control button, and the left mouse. And that lets you click and drag different objects within the model. If you don't hit the control button, but the left mouse and move, it drags the entire model. So I'll just add one more queue and one more server. Then I'm going to put an entity conveyor. And now I want product or whatever my finished uh, finished goods are. They, are now that they've been worked on or I've had diff three different operations performed on them, then I'm going to convey the product out of the model. And the way to do that is to add a sync. So this is kind of the opposite. You can see even with the symbols here, this adds entity to the system and this takes entities away from the system. One way of thinking about it is that the entity generator, and I'll just demonstrate that here, by renaming these. The entity generator is like the supplier. This is process one, process two, and process three. And then the sink, I think of as, and for a simple flow model like I'm going to demonstrate, this is like a customer. And once you've delivered the product to the customer, it exits the system. Now, just for completeness, I'm going to add another conveyor from the um, from the supplier to the queue. Now, 
we need to link the different steps through the model. So I'm going to I'm going to click on Create Entity Links. So as you can read here, when this is enabled, entities are linked when the selection is changed. The Entity Flow, I also want to activate to show in arrows as I make these connections. So now I've got this simple model, uh, these objects with these entities sitting here. So I'm going to connect the SIM entity and you can see this arrow now. This is my kind of process flow arrow. I'm going to connect to the supplier, to the conveyor, to the queue, first process, next conveyor, second queue, second process, third conveyor, third queue, and third process, final conveyor, and out to the customer. Now I'm still in this connection mode, so I need to so if I click anywhere, it's going to start creating connections I don't want. So I've got to come up here and deactivate this connection tool. And now my cursor is just a regular pointer. This is a good way to just quickly check that you have everything connected then. The SIM entity to the supplier, you can see the blue arrows into and out of the conveyor, uh, through the processes, conveyor, can, if you can't see your arrows very well, you can click and drag things out of the way and say, okay, that's right. Same thing here, just to make sure it's coming in and out of the conveyor properly. In and out of this queue, into this conveyor, and there's a little blue arrow here you can see out to the customer. This is a good time to point out the input editor. When you click on an entity in your simulation model. Come down to this input editor, which you, can, which you can undock and move around, and you'll see the next component is Entity Conveyor 4, and if you look at the screen you can see the label Entity Conveyor 4 there, that makes sense, and the prototype entity, so what the, the prototype for the entities to be generated. So it is SIM Entity 1, which is my small brown disk. You can have different kinds of objects being introduced into the system, so you'd have different uh, SIM entities um, dragged into your model. And so on. You can see the queue. Um, and the first process the next component is the Entity Conveyor 1 and the Wait Queue, so it's already expecting to see one, is called Q1. Process 2 and Process 3, you can see they're all defined. In theory, that's all I need to, to have a working model. And I can press Play. JamSim is nice, it'll remind me that I haven't saved this thing yet, so I'll say yes. So we'll just create, I'll save this uh, as my first model, simple model. Now here's where it gets a little bit weird. When I click run, you don't actually see anything happening. And but if we come to the output viewer, you can see the time is ticking away, and there's uh, for different entities that I'm choosing. I have now process three selected right now. It's showing me statistics. And if I scroll down further, you can see that it's process 27, 28, 29 entities. The problem is I don't have any time set, so everything is happening instantaneously. I don't want that. Nothing happens instantaneously in the real world. So now we need to start adding some real times. We'll start at the supplier. This has the supplier, they call it an inter-arrival time, where it'll deliver a product into the model every 2.77 seconds. I'm not sure why it chooses that. Let's make it a little simpler and say three 
seconds. You could choose any um, unit of measure you want. You can do three seconds, three minutes, three hours, and then S, an M, or an H. Um, put a space between the three and the S. And entities per arrival. Let's say I want it to deliver three pieces at a time every three seconds. That might be a little quick, every six seconds. And it's going to deliver something like entity number one. The conveyor. You can see the travel time by default is 0, 0.0 hours. Let's say I want this to take three seconds. So I'm going to go and collect, click every one of the entities in my model, one at a time. Um, service time, which is in value stream terminology, would be, we would call it cycle time. So how long does process one take? Let's say it takes five seconds. Then the conveyor, two seconds. The next process. Let's say that takes six seconds. The next conveyor maybe is very quickly, a quick at two seconds, and the final process, maybe it's a final packaging or something, I don't know. We'll make that a fast one, two seconds, and then a fairly lengthy delivery. I don't know, you can even make it uh, something like 10 seconds out to the customer. If I go, uh, run, it's going to want to make sure that I want to, do you, do you want to save the changes that I made to the model? I'll say um, yes. So now we can actually see things happening. So remember we had it delivering three at a time. One was immediately taken up by process number one. Another three delivered. And everything is taking the amount of time that I specified in my model. And remember, we had a really slow output. This is um, a transport truck heading out to the out to the customer, for example. You can see this is keeping track of the model time. I'm running at uh, a single speed, so you can also speed up two times, four times, eight times speed, sixteen. You can run it at a crazy, crazy rate and let it um, just run. And so you can see what would happen over days. So we're, we're coming up on one hour um, in the model. And you can adjust this as you're running. So you say, OK, I want after about a here, after about an hour, I want to slow it back down again and see in real time what would be happening here. And then you could, it shows up. Clearly, I have a problem, right? I have the supplier delivering material into my system far too quickly. The button beside run is a reset. It'll confirm that I want to reset the simulation time to zero. And so now I have a back to a clean model again. There's some things we can start to do to make the model a little prettier. Um, so one of the, for example, the cues, and you saw the way it was just stacking out to the left, that's the default. Um, under format, there's a maximum per line. And if I set that to three and run the model again, just very quickly, and I'll speed it up a bit. And now you can see instead of the cues just going this crazy line. It's more like a classic stack up of parts. So I like setting this max per line to something reasonable like that. Okay. One thing I recommend that you add to your model are some metrics or visual indicators to show you what's going on. You find these under graphic objects. There's all kinds of options. Uh, one that I like, for example, is a bar gauge. So I'm going to take and just drag and drop the bar gauge into my model here. And
and you can see the data source is one of the key inputs for this and it's the default is 0.5 and you can see so 0.5 is what the bar gauge is currently displaying. Now this is where um, I just introduced to you uh, a field editor in JamSim. I don't want to have a bar gauge just locked at 0.5. I want it to react to what's happening in process 2. I'm going to click the down arrow here and that opens up a little bit of an editor. We call it an input builder. I want to show status about an entity and to get a list of my entities I use the left square bracket. This is why I'm doing this tutorial so that you don't have to hunt through the manual. The left square bracket and that calls up a series or a list of the different entities that are in the model. I want to have a look at what's going on with process 2. So I'm going to select process 2. It automatically closes the bracket. Now, to call up a detail or a parameter associated with process 2, I'm going to hit the period. And now it calls up a list of sort of characteristics or features or values associated with process 2. This fraction completed is perfect for a bar gauge. But you can see it returns true if it's a break if a breakdown is being repaired, um, fraction of calendar time that the process is available, all kinds of things, whether it's open or not, what its parent is, what the setup time is. Okay, so there's lots and lots of characteristics that you can use for math statements or checking or graphing, but in my case I'm just going to pick fraction completed. That makes it nice and simple. And it shows you um, in this little bar here the present value for this is zero. And that's a good indicator that this equation or this input that I have is valid. If I put in I just type the letter C and now there's no there's no such thing as a fraction completed so it is giving me an error message. You want to see that you have an actual value represented or that this kind of equation that you've entered here is valid. So I'm going to hit accept. And now when I run and confirm I want to save this, as this process is running, oops, I got to slow this down a little bit. As the process runs, now you can see the bar gauge shows you the percentage complete, going from zero to a 100%. And when it is complete, you can see this entity then gets passed on to the next part of the process. Because this is a simple model, you don't actually see the thing being worked on, it just sits there. And that's why I find something like this bar gauge is really convenient. It helps um, visualize what's happening. Okay. Another um, another indicator that I like to add or piece of inf when you want to add some more information into your model is this text. There's a little bit of uh, there's a couple choices. There's an overlay text which goes into a fixed position in your model. That's I think of that like this title up here is fixed. It doesn't move as I move my model around. I don't want that. I want that's the overlay text option. What I want is text which appears in the 3D model universe just as all my other objects. So I'm going to drag my text and you can see it has an input editor as well and the data source here is none. But if I click on data source, click the down arrow, then I get my input builder again. I want to show some information about the customer, so left bracket, select customer, dot, just like a lot of programming languages where you have the, um, the object and a modifier or a parameter as part of the object, this is very similar to that. And I would like to, to show um, number added. 
So number of entities received from the upstream after the model has been run. And you can see the value is five. Now I'm going to add, I would like to just having, I, okay, let me just demonstrate. I can click accept and run. Okay, and we have two kinds of problems here already. This just shows the word text because this format here is just saying text. This is where you need a little bit of formatting. There's percent %s means it's going to show a string um, or percent with a you know, um, 0.1f. I think it was like a floating decimal place with a single decimal. So percent .1 or .2 or .3f um, shows you floating point number. In this case, um, the string is a good option here. But it's just showing me 13. That's not all together that useful. So I'm going to select the data source again, click the down arrow to get my editor. I'd like to make this um, a little more informative. So I want to include some text of my, my own. If I put double quotes, and then I'm going to say received, colon, space, quote, and then the plus key. And now you can see I built a new string, and the string is the word received plus the number returned by this function. And in my uh, data source at the bottom, you can see it, the present value is received 28. So if I accept that, and now I have a useful counter showing me how many pieces have been received by the customer. Okay, I'm going to reset the simulation back to zero. So I've shown you a bar gauge, I've shown you a text just with um, simple status. Another good indicator to include is something like a graph. And every time I click, you can see the input editor down at the bottom always keeps track of what I've selected. So I pick the graph. For graph title, maybe I want to change this to, um, I'll just keep it simple to start, inventory. So now the title is changed. Number of points is the um, horizontal axis, the x-axis. And again, the data source. And it, if I ran this now, I would get an error because it's a required input. So I have to, I have to explain what it is I am plotting. Let's choose Q1. and the queue length. So that's the number of parts in that queue plus Q2 length plus left bracket Q3 Q length. Let's just see how that looks to start. Again, running the model confirms I want to save it. So now I have two in Q. So this, my graph bumps up to two. Now I have three in Q, and you can see that it comes out of Q and it's actually being worked on, and then um, it gets passed and sits into another Q. So you can see my inventory level steadily increases. I've only got this 
it's set on a scale of zero to five. That's not sufficient for my model. So I want to, uh, that's my y axis and my y n. Let's say, let's change it to 100. Nah, maybe 100 is too much. Let's change it to 50. And I don't need an interval of one. I can have it count every five. So this is a nice live time, um, time-based graph that shows inventory steadily growing as my model runs. Okay. Another thing that you can do to improve the look of the um, simulation is to change your pictures around a little bit so that they make a little bit more sense to the viewer. For example, this doesn't mean anything to somebody looking at it. It doesn't really represent a supplier very well. If you uh, right click on the entity, you can change the graphics. You can select something that's already built into the system if you want to turn it into some other simple thing, but I find what's kind of cool is if you import a graphic element. So I've picked my folder that includes my images. I've downloaded some images just off of the internet and uh, you can also build your own images, actually in this case, build my own images in PowerPoint using the just line tools and shape tools in PowerPoint, uh, clicking and saving as a picture. The default comes up as all supported 3D files. Uh, so these are DAE or object files. In my case, I'm just dealing with two dimensional. And so I'm uh, to click and say all supported image files, not just the 3D files. And I just want to show just um, what I think is a uh, nice simple modeling system. It's like what we do for a value stream map. So if I import this image that I've created and hit accept, so now I have a supplier who creates these entities and delivers them into my processes. So let's try the same thing for the process. Change graphics. I'm going to import. It's already selected the right folder. My supported images. So just a simple process shape. And the same thing here to change graphics. Now I already have this process shape loaded. So I can select an existing image here and here. So if you're used to building value stream maps, you'd recognize what, I've, what I'm slowly building here. The same thing with a customer. I'm going to change the graphics. It's the, effectively the same image that we use between uh, suppliers and um, customers. I've even been a little fancy and I can change the graphics of my queue. Do an inventory symbol. I like to make these conveyors a little bit thicker. Um, so for my model, if I change the line width to about six, that seems to be a bit better. You can change the colors around. Conveyor is just a straight line. I think if I choose um, it to be an arrow, although it's 
not really much of a difference. There's a little tiny arrow tip in the end. But at least it gets them a little thicker. Okay. So for me, this just looks better. Uh, now I have supplier coming into process one, sitting in an inventory, moving to process two, running, coming into Q3, being processed, and finally being delivered to a customer. So this is a nice value stream map with um, status indicators showing me what's going on, charts, bar charts and such. The beauty of this is you can, instead of just modeling it and putting in queue times and processing times and having this snapshot with a bunch of text like a classic value stream map, this is the beauty of the simulation system. You you give it the information and you actually run it and you can see what's happening in real time. So if you if these were the real values, now we wouldn't be dealing in seconds, but in minutes or hours in reality. But if this is the same sort of ratios that you had in your own system and you ran it, you would immediately see that the supplier is far outstripping the pace of the rest of the process. And you'd want to take some action and change how the supplier is producing materials or delivering materials. Let's actually go ahead and do that then. Under the model builder find probability distributions and there's a number of different distribution models, exponential, gamma, beta, Weibull distributions and so on. Most uh, college students would be familiar with a normal distribution. So I'm going to drag this distribution into my model and then sort of to make it clear, say that that's what's controlling the introduction of these entities. And you can see the unit type is required. So I'm going to pull down and show that this is a time unit. with a minimum value. So now we're talking about deliveries. So the deliveries could be no sooner than every three seconds and no longer than every 10 seconds, I don't know, 12 seconds. With a mean of um, six seconds. maybe a five second. I want everything to sort of fit in my model. You can also define the standard deviation. In this case it's calculated um, uh, 2.7. I'm going to have a standard deviation of one second. Now my supplier, well, I'm going to call these arrival times. For your entities, you can't put a space like this. It's going to object. You can't have a blank or spaces in them. So you'll see that whenever we've named these things, I call it arrival times. We use, or I'm using, um, what I know of is called camel case. It's it called a camel case because you, every once in a while, you get an uppercase in the word, so you get these sort of hump. So. You separate your words not by spaces, but by an uppercase. All right. Now I'll choose my supplier, and instead of the inter-arrival time going to be six seconds, I want the inter-arrival time to be defined by the arrival time. You can see I can either in create a mathematical model myself, or pick this model that I've built here, this distribution. Save them all again and run it. And so now you can see there's a bit of a, more of a pause. And the inter-arrival time 
of the product is not just as fixed every three seconds or every six seconds, whatever we've programmed. And again, you can speed up the model. Now, we still have a problem. Right? We're still far outstripping the pace of production in this thing. I probably need to come back to my arrival time and say the maybe the mean here is uh, maybe it's every 12 seconds with a maximum of 30 seconds. Okay, so now I've got a much more balanced model. I still have some materials stacking up here, but if you come over, this is where this graph is nice to see. My inventory is climbing slowly, which is much better than I had before. Here, I'm going to pause this. Again, if you're kind of, you want to have a model that looks good when you run it, my queue now here is showing parts just sort of spilling across the floor. So again, I'm going to change the format for my second queue to, to show, again, three parts per line. And while I'm at it, I'm going to change my last queue to the same thing. So now this is a little cleaner. You can see very clearly how this model is now much more graphical in nature. I have had to make adjustments to my supplier to control the rate of product intake. Um, it's still far too fast, and now I have parts queuing up in the second process. It shows me that for this process, bottle number one is my bottleneck, number two is my second longest, and process three is quick. So maybe I move resources around, or even better, I do a proper lean event and um, first off, introduce just in time delivery and remove the bottlenecks in the process. I'm going to switch gears for a minute and show, I'm going to load a new model. I'd like to show you two more um, slightly more advanced elements in JamSim that you can add that I think are really useful to creating a, a more practical model. The first one I'd like to demonstrate is an assembly model. You can see I've got an entity generator going to a queue and a server and then to another queue just like we had before but I have a second entity generator going to a different queue and server and a fourth queue or a alternate queue. And I want a process where these different parts, maybe something comes from the paint line or a welding line or a sub-assembly, and then they come together to create a new assembly or a finished assembly that then moves on to the rest of the process. This is very typical in a lot of real world situations, instead of just one single thing coming in, being worked on and being passed out of the system. JamSim has then an assembly operator which I'm going to drag into my model. The uh, so we can already see what are the what are the required inputs. The next component. So after this assembly, I'm going to go to Q5. The Q wait list is going to be. I pull the down arrow, you can see I can select more than one item. This assembly operation is going to pull from Q2 and Q4. You can see Q2 and Q4 in my model. The other required entry input is a, another prototype entry because it doesn't generate boxes or disks, it generates some other thing. It's its own unique element. So I need to drag a new uh, simulation entity or product um, 
prototype into my model. And now for the prototype entry, I can choose Sim Entity 3. Okay. And if I have done this right, So I have these boxes and circles entering into the system, being taken care of by these servers, going to these queues, and the assembly generates, consumes these two elements and creates its own element, that is, uh, these circles. Here again, I think changing the graphics makes your model um, much more realistic and easier to understand. So I want to change these to something that make a lot more sense or it's going to be a little more visually um, realistic to what's going on. Let me just show you what I've done for this model. I like using PowerPoint as kind of my staging ground for graphics. It lets me open up a little PowerPoint for a particular project and I can make notes or just save graphics in it. So in this case I've um, gone to the internet and I found royalty-free images that I can use for non-commercial purposes like this. So one is a bicycle frame and the other one is a bicycle wheel. I've resized them in my PowerPoint to be about the right scale. Uh, you can kind of see I could use these to build a bicycle and what I've done then, um, when I also change the transparency, you might uh, like to do that under color. I can set the transparent color, and I chose the white on here, and it lets it see through the white spaces to the background. Um, very frequently, if you load images off the internet, it comes with a solid white background and this is one of the nice things with PowerPoint is you can select a transparent color. It doesn't do a perfect job but close enough for the purposes of our model. Alright, so I have a bicycle tire. I can save that as a picture and, I would, and PNG, the Portable Network Graphics Format, works just fine or JPEGs. Okay, I've already saved these. So I have a wheel, the picture of a wheel saved, I have a picture of a frame saved, and then I, I took a picture of this assembly, the frame with two wheels, and I saved that as a picture of a bicycle, or an assembly. While I was at it, I've got a, I found a, a little picture of a spray gun, this is a PowerPoint icon uh, with just some wrenches, a PowerPoint icon of a truck, and a PowerPoint icon of a little person. All very, very simple, but then I'll be able to use these in my model. We've got a nice model where frame supply goes into a queue for painting, which goes into a queue for the assembly, wheel supply with the gears put on, and then the assembly puts them together and out to the customer number required. So it requires one frame and two wheels. So I've, I've listed in the order as my queue list. There's all kinds of other things like matching and so on um, which we don't need to define. And now if I run it, which I say again of course, you'll see that the wheels are now consumed two at a time and the frames consumed only one at a time. I want to show one more thing that you can do to make your model a little more realistic or to add some controls to the model and this is a good demonstration. We have frames stacking to the rafters and wheels coming in at a more reasonable rate. And in reality, of course, there should be some controls on the flow of materials. If you had this kind of a process in 
reality, the person doing assembling would certainly go back to the painting department and say, look, you need to slow down um, and stop giving me so many more frames. I don't need any more frames. So I want to add a control system to this. Here under basic objects is an expression th threshold. You can do time thresholds as well, but I like this expression threshold. It specifies a logical condition for which an activity is permitted. In other words, some rules that allow some uh, part or some process to continue. So I'm going to drag this threshold in. It's going to show red and green according to the status. And for me, it's going to be based on this queue. The, you can see the required input is this open condition, kind of like a valve. So when is the valve going to open? And by that I mean when is it going to allow material to come in? Well, that's what we're going to define it as. So again, I want to call up the editor. And the logical statement to allow the painting of frames to come through is when the frame queue queue length is less than say 3 so right now it's um, this is over 3 so the valve would be shut Now we need somebody to pay attention to this. Let's say we want to say the painter won't paint any more frames until they're needed. So under the paint, in the input editor, there's a tab we haven't explored yet called thresholds. There's an operating threshold list. A list of thresholds that must be satisfied for the object to operate. And there's different details, but that's what we're looking for. And if I now click the down arrow, I have an expression threshold that I can use. And I can say allow painting. So in painting threshold to operate, painting has to be allowed. Let me save my model, reset the time to zero, and run it. So right now, the Q here is less than three, so this is green. Now it's three. So allow painting is red, painting is stopped, no more frames are built. And the inventory here is stopped at three. Now, it creates more problems in the model, of course. The frame supply doesn't know what's going on. So, in a real process, um, you'd stop at the painting, and then if the painting stops, you could add another queue, or sorry, another threshold here, and have the painting regulate the frame supply. All right, so I've shown you the basics. There's a lot more that you could do with this, but I think with the few tools that I've shown you, and you're welcome to explore and find more, you can build some fairly sophisticated uh, processes with this tool. I would invite you to go on to YouTube and look at other jam sim simulations that have been created. Uh, there's a manual that you can download from the jam sim website that also goes through and explains all the different parameters and characteristics or features here. I do find it's not the most brilliant manual or easy to understand, which is why I felt compelled to create this little tutorial for you. But hopefully this has given you a head start and given you a chance to explore creating process simulations using a program like Jamsin. So thank you very much for watching and good luck in your future projects.